Hello, everyone, and welcome to the session, The Balancing Effect, the Influence of pH on Chronic Wound Healing. This is supported by a generous educational grant from Ergo Medical North America. My name is Paul Kim. I'm a professor in the Departments of Plastic Surgery and Orthopedic Surgery here at University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I'm also the medical director of the wound program here at UT Southwestern. I'm joined by two of my colleagues, Dr. Greg Schultz, who is a professor at the University of Florida, and also Dr. Mark Mellon, who is a surgeon at Fairview Health Services Wound Healing Institute. Here are our disclosures. I just wanna mention that um, my lecture is gonna be a more broad lecture talking about the role of antimicrobials um, in infection control and wound management. Uh, Dr. Schultz and Dr. Mellon will talk specifically about pH. But as far as, be, as bacteria are concerned, we know that alkalinity, which uh, the wound base tends to be more alkalinic the more chronic it is, is influenced heavily by bacteria that's populating the surface. And that bacteria can lead to frank infection, but also can lead to delayed healing. We also know there's a tremendous cost to treating infection in wounds, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. When we look at the U.S., this is 2014 numbers, by the way, we spent about $97 billion in Medicare funding, just Medicare. I'm not talking about Medicaid. I'm not talking about private payers, about $97 billion on wound and wound-related complications. And specifically, the bulk of that cost is in the inpatient side. About $24 billion is spent on the inpatient side. So what often happens is in our practices that we all know, these chronic wounds can get infected. And often this hospitalization is for IV antibiotic therapy or, or, or abscess, uh, excuse me, OR incision and drainage to drain an abscess or to excisionally debride a wound. Now, a lot of the cost really when a patient's hospitalized is not for hospital services that are on the floor, but bulk of it is costs are related to in the OR. If a patient has to go to the operating room, especially for infection to remove all non-viable dead tissue, then it costs a lot of money. In fact, and most patients in the hospital are not there for operative reasons, but the cost of hospitalization, the bulk of that is in the operating room. Whenever I'm faced with a patient for the first time or as a consultation, I think about their healing potential. And I call this the wound equation, where there's a one in the numerator, in the denominator, there's bacteria, perfusion, and tissue mechanics. And we're going to talk a lot about bacteria today. But really, the driving factor of healing potential is the host. And that host is defined by multiple different variables, including their comorbidity profile, which is probably the easiest thing that we can, we can put our fingers on. But there are other issues, including health disparities, which really came to light during COVID-19 pandemic era. But other aspects, including their genomic profile, their access to health care, their nutritional status, all of those things drive the potential to heal for these wounds. So it's not just a simple a pH issue or an infection issue. It's largely driven by the innate ability for the patient to heal based on these external and internal factors. When I think about the host, the easiest thing to identify is how sick they are through different classification systems by counting the number of comorbidities they have. So we published this paper on, on a population of patients that I served when I was in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University Hospital. The average ASA was 3.5, and that's defined by severe to extreme systemic disorders. That's often those patients that have wounds. Remember, the wounds are a manifestation often of systemic disease, and the, the most difficult wounds to heal is a manifestation of some systemic disease, like diabetes, for example. You know, diabetes impacts the entirety of the, the body and affects every uh, major organ or even minor organ system, if there is a minor organ system, every organ system in the body. That includes the skin. Now, this is an interesting paper looking at the number of comorbidities in the inpatient population. 82% of patients in the hospital right now, in your hospital right now, have five plus comorbidities. And these comorbidities by themselves may not be such a big deal. For example, if a patient has hypertension, and by itself, hypertension can be easily managed. But if you add renal disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, and other different medical conditions to it, then the patient becomes more complex. And that's the five plus comorbidities that we're talking about a little bit earlier. This is just an example from my own patient 
uh, from one of, one of my own patients has 72 problems listed on her problem list. Now, these issues that are wound related are difficult problems, things like necrotizing fasciitis, wet or dry gangrene, and surgical dehist issues. These are hard and complex problems to address. And infection is a major driver in this. And if you, in this example, if you see the patient has underlying bone infection, osteomyelitis, and overlying soft tissue infection, these are often problems that we can't correct. We often see this in the diabetic foot ulcer. All of these wounds are populated by bacteria. Now, whether it's gonna cause an acute infection or not, don't know. But many of these are often, often lead to hospitalization. And this is, especially in this compromised host that we're talking about in the diabetic patient. Now, there are other common wounds in the lower extremity encountered in lower extremity. By the way, most wounds greater than 60% are lower extremity wounds below the knee wounds. These venous ulcers are problematic and they're resource intensive to take care of. Not many of them, honestly, end up in the hospital for, uh, for any length of time or even require OR intervention. These are often managed in the outpatient clinic, but these wounds can be very chronic as, and they can be populated by bacteria or colonies of bacteria uh, for a long period of time, and it prevents them from healing. Now, there are two types of bacteria that I want to talk about, and we're just touching on this. This could be a, a lecture by itself. It's, you know, several hours of information. But there are these planktonic bacteria, which we, are com we commonly associate with the clinical signs of infection. These are kind of free-floating bacteria that cause localized cellulitis, abscesses, and so on. There are other kinds of bacteria that are harder to identify, and it's biofilm. I mean, we've heard a lot about biofilm in the past, but I don't think people really understand what biofilm is. These are colonies of relatively senescent bacteria that are not metabolically active. And that's important. And we're going to talk about that distinction in just a few minutes. You can't see biofilm. What you're seeing in, is an inflammatory reaction to the biofilm. That's the surrounding redness, the sloughy tissue that we see. Unless you have electron scanning microscopy, you're not going to be able to see these. But these bacteria often break out into planktonic bacteria and can cause localized infection. And they certainly cause chronicity of wounds. Now, how do you treat infection? Well, seemingly there's a lot of options. And here I'm just giving an example from the, the, from the Infectious Disease Society of America for diabetic foot infections. And they have a, on their website, there are recommendations for different antibiotics that you can provide depending on whether it's mild, moderate, or severe infection. In many cases, I see patients that have been on multiple antibiotics. And the problem is that they not only develop resistance to those antibiotics, but also developed allergic reactions to many of these antibiotics. So for example, this is just one of my patients I'm showing you, she's allergic to erythromycin, phloxacin, and aminoglycosides, ciprofloxacin, doxycycline, macrolides, minocycline, penicillins, and tetracycline. So we're running out of choices here. And these multi-drug resistant bacteria continue to evolve. So we're, start, we're trying to catch up, but we're kind of running out of options. One of the reasons is, is these resistance patterns that we're seeing, and this is from the CDC website. Once a, a new antibiotic is introduced, there's already resistant bacteria to the antibiotic, specifically for that, that bacteria. And within a few years, they develop new resistance to antibiotics. And in the past, what we could rely on were new drugs that were in the development pipeline, but there's simply not that many drugs being developed. And that's largely due to there's a lack of incentive to develop new antibiotic therapies. So we think we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, but we're really running into a limitation of what we can actually provide our patients. And many of these new, newer evolved bacteria are resistant to everything. So our options are becoming much more limited. This is one of the, the publications that I'm most proud of that doesn't get a lot of discussion, but I think it's an important point. Many of us who work in the outpatient centers do regular debridements. And one of the reasons why we do debridements is to remove or reduce the amount of bacteria on the surface. So we actually tested this. So we looked at, at, at a time, one single time point, which means at one clinic visit, what happens to the amount of bacteria after we debride sharply, debride these wounds? And we looked at bacterial fluorescence, quantitative cultures, and semi-qualitative cultures to assess this. And what we found was there was no difference after we excisionally debrided. Now, I still believe in excisional or regular debridement in the clinic, uh, 
However, it may not have the impact on bacteria that we once thought it did. So we look at other strategies for management of bacteria on this wound surface, and we look at topicals, for example. So when you rely on things like polysporin, genomycin, mupirocin cream, the problem is that they use the same mechanism of action as oral or IV antibiotics. And we know in biofilm, it's not gonna be effective for that. So we need to look at other things like including hypochlorous acid, which uh, topical anti-infectives like hypochlorous acid can eradicate bacteria on the surface of the wound. The problem is some of these have unwanted side effects. For example, people like Dakin solution. Well, it's cytotoxic to the surrounding tissue. Sure, you want to convert that wound to a healthier bed, but the problem is that you don't want to cause um, uh, other damage to the healthy tissue. You want to just sort of target and remove the bacteria. And so this is where things like hypochlorous acid makes a lot of sense because of its neutral pH. It's not damaging to the healthy tissue, but it does impact the bacteria. And, I, and the analogy often, I often use is that antibiotics are a, a sort of a laser guided missile on sp specific targets. So antibiotics, for example, certain antibiotics target gram positive bacteria. Whereas antiseptics is more of a cluster bomb, which sort of kind of wipes out everything, but it also can wipe out friendlies. So this is where you want to be careful on your antiseptic choice and where hypochlorous acid is a safe alternative. I think ultimately it comes down to the host. The host is compromised. We all know that. Patients are sicker and their medical problems are much more complex. So it's a multimodal approach to take care of these wounds that are on these complex hosts. We know that most antimicrobials are ineffective or have unwanted effects. And we know that hypochlorous acid is safe and effective as an adjunct of treatment. So in general, I think we need to think about the patient and their needs and the cost utility of the things that we're using. Um, and we look, need to look at the evidence to see how clinically effective they actually are. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Gregory Schultz, Emeritus Professor at the University of Florida and previous director of the Institute for Wound Research. It's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to present this educational webinar um, to, today uh, with uh, Dr. Kim and Dr. Meelan. And I'm going to talk about optimizing pH of wound beds to promote healing. Very quickly, my learning objectives are Really, we just want to recognize the different pH values that we see in normal fluids and tissues and look at how that changes during the four phases of normal wound healing. Uh, then we're going to review information on high pHs like 8, 9 in chronic wound fluid and how these change as chronic wounds get good treatment and begin to heal. And we also want to have a better understanding of how high pH values contribute to impaired healing chronic wounds, and then how to optimally incorporate treatment of chronic wounds with uh, hypochlorous acid solution, for example, pH 5.5, to correct these detrimental high pH values back to optimal values and to control the bio burden. Well, there's multiple different pHs and fluids in our body. Uh, obviously, blood plasma is about 7.4, but can change depending on oxygenation uh, and CO2 exchange. Urine normally is a little acidic, uh, but it can range quite different uh, values. Saliva in our mouths normally about 7.4, but it also can have some slight differences. And, and tears also usually are, are relatively neutral in pH. Now, the vagina in healthy conditions normally has a much lower pH due to the lactobacillus bacteria that secrete lots of lactic acids. And when there is a bacterial vaginosis, that allows more pathogenic bacteria uh, such as Gardnerella to, to begin to grow. Now, normal healthy skin has a pH of about 5.5, uh, so between four and six. And of course, our gastric fluid is very acidic down to around uh, one and a half to three and a half. So you're familiar with the four phases of wound healing, hemostasis, inflammation, repair, and remodeling. And obviously hemostasis is when our blood clots releases the platelet factors that leads the wound into the inflammatory phase as we'll look where the neutrophils, especially uh, and M1 macrophages activate, incorporate and kill bacteria by generating reactive oxygen species. That allows the wound to move more into the repair phase. And then finally, when the 
wound is epithelialized, it can move into the remodeling phase. Now, the key is when many chronic wounds fail to heal, that's because they get stuck in this chronic inflammatory phase with the high pHs. And so that's when we want to lower the pH back to allow the wound to move out of the inflammatory phase into the repair phase. As I indicated, one of the key things that happens in the inflammatory phase is our neutrophils and macrophages engulf and kill bacteria. They do it, as shown in the middle panel, by generating reactive oxygen species, such as hypochlorous acid and hydrogen peroxide. And this happens very, very rapidly, as shown in the right panel, within minutes. This requires a low pH within the endocytic vesicle uh, to allow the reactive oxygen molecules to have their most effective uh, uh, oxidation and killing of bacteria. Now, real quickly, normal skin, when we look at the epidermis, is about 5.5. And this is due to a, a number of uh, factors, uh, in, including the uh, keratinized epidermis that um, is able to uh, produce the uh, fatty acids that are helping to lower the pH and also to provide an environment for some of the normal antimicrobial proteins uh, that our body makes to control bacteria on the surface of the skin. When there's an initial wound, the fluid within the wound drops to about pH 6. This is due to the plasma and really reduces the available oxygen and leads to a slight buildup of acetic acid compared to the non-injured dermis, which is more around pH 7. Now, as the inflammatory phase kicks in, as I indicated, the pH tends to drop to about pH 5. This is in large part due to the acid production by the neutrophils and also to the uh, generation of lactic acid that is occurring in the lower oxygen saturation within the wound bed. Now, as the inflammatory cells kill the bugs, it allows the wound to move into the repair phase. This is when the new capillaries begin to form, and that helps to uh, uh, reconstruct the normal vasculature. So the pH tends, tends to rise a little bit, more like to around pH 7. And when the wound bed has been generated from the provisional fibrin matrix into a more uh, typical uh, scar formation, then our epithelial cells can move across it and the epithelium of the skin begins to reassume a pH of about five. And of course, the dermis drops back to about uh, a pH of, of 7.4 due to the repair of the vascular supply. The problem is when chronic wounds get stuck in the inflammatory phase, um, the pH tends to rise, and we'll look at that, but that's in oftentimes due to the production of lactic acid and other metabolites that the bacteria are making uh, in the uh, chronic wound bed. So the key really is to try to reduce that wound bed that's at about pH eight and a half or so down into the range that's more compatible with the repair phase uh, at around pH seven. So why is high pH and wound bed bad? Well, there are several answers. Uh, as I'll show you, it helps for many types of bacteria that are pathogenic to have a, a better optimum environment to grow. And as I'll show you also to help the formation of biofilms. And it's reported that bacterial colonization may contribute to this shift of the alkaline pH. And as I said, uh, as I'll show you, pathogenic bacteria and biofilms tend to prefer to exist at a higher pH. And if you look at the optimum growth pH for most of the prevalent microorganisms, the pathogens, you can see that almost all of them have a slightly uh, basic pH away from the acidic pH uh, that would be more favorable to the functioning of the neutrophils and macrophages. It turns out that targeting pH and making the wound environment more acidic could actually benefit the wound healing process. So um, the biofilm is uh, also a very important component. And 
it turns out that biofilm prefers, for example, for pseudomonas originosa to have a higher pH, um, and that the increase of the biofilm mass actually tends to increase at higher pHs. Um, increasing the pH uh, will also uh, have a uh, effect on other microorganisms and allow them, as I showed the previous slide, to, even for the planktonic bacteria to have a better growth phase. And uh, it turns out that in lab studies that um, if uh, there is a more alkaline pH, this actually helps some bacteria like Staph aureus to actually attach better, which again, uh, correlates with the incidence of uh, biofilms at more basic or alkaline pH in chronic wounds. Now, you're familiar, I'm sure, with biofilms. In the center panel, you see a scanning electron micrograph of mature biofilm on the surface of a wound bed. Panel A shows the biofilm not only on the surface, but also in the deeper dermal layers. Uh, and this becomes important for us to understand how to try and kill and remove biofilms from wounds. Now, the problem is that when biofilms form uh, the, at the higher pHs, it actually leads to highly elevated levels of proteases, and as shown in the right-hand slides, if there's high pHs, essential proteins like fibronectin that are important for epithelial cell attachment and migration will actually be proteolytically degraded, and that impairs the ability of the epithelial cells to move across the wound bed. If the inflammation is controlled, proteases are controlled, the pH is appropriate, then the epithelial cells can mig proliferate, migrate across the wound and actually epithelialize and heal the wound. So another important point for us to remember is that our body makes the alpha defensins, which are our normal microbicide and virucide peptides. Now this is a cationic positively charged molecule. And so the bo bottom line is that high pH can actually lead to deprotonation and inactivation of the alpha defensins that are one of our body's major antimicrobial and antiviral uh, proteins. And so we need to understand that uh, elevating the pH actually helps to defeat the effect of our natural antimicrobial peptides. Now, hypochlorous acid um, has a pH of about 7.5, and you can see that when we go to lower pHs of around 5 or so, that's when we have the optimum uh, oxidation potential and the optimum stability for hypochlorous acid compared to the pH 10, like in Dakin's solution, which typically has a pH of about 9 to 10. So, so the, the real sweet spot for hypochlorous acid antimicrobial activity and low cytotoxicity is about a pH of 5. If we look at the microbicidal activity, the MBC for hypochlorous acid compared to sodium hypochlorite or hydrogen peroxide, we can see that again, that the hypochlorous acid is much more effective, that is requires much lower concentrations to effectively kill Escherichia coli, Pseudomonas or Staph, three major pathogens, compared to the concentrations that are required by the sodium hypochlorite, the deprotonated hypochlorous acid or the hydrogen peroxide. And if we look at a biofilm model, we can see again that the optimum effect for killing mature biofilms uh, is to use the hypochlorous acid at lower pH. And you can see that within about five minutes, viability of a mature pseudomonas biofilm grown in the laboratory is reduced by about half. And this is at a concentration of about 200 parts per million, uh, which is even uh, lower than the concentration that we can effectively use in hypochlorous acid, like in the uh, pH 5.5 uh, solution. In addition, the cytotoxicity of hypochlorous acid is much better compared to the cytotoxicity of various sodium hypochlorite or other types of uh, microbicidal. Uh, chemicals that are typically seen in many of the uh, commonly used cleansing solutions. The other aspect, if we look at the uh, histological evidence of the 
effect of hypochlorous acid versus sodium hypochlorite, for example, on lung tissue after lavaging, you can see that in the hypochlorous acid uh, line in, in, in B that the histology of the lung tissue is very well preserved compared to hypochlorous acid, the Dakin solution, and is almost similar to what we see in normal lung. So this again indicates that in tissues, the, the cytotoxicity of hypochlorous acid is very good. Now we can express this in a little bit simpler combined uh, calculation, which is the relative therapeutic index, which is the concentration that um, is uh, required to provide uh, cytotoxicity divided by the concentration needed to kill bacteria. So we want a high number here. And you can see again on this log scale that hypochlorous acid is far superior as a therapeutic index compared to the sodium hypochlorite or hypochlorous acid. And again, the higher the therapeutic index, the more effective and less cytotoxic the uh, molecule is. So it appears that what we want to do is to try to acidify the uh, wound environment in chronic non-healing wounds to uh, provide a better microbicidal activity and also to reduce cytotoxicity. We can express this together in the step down and step up strategy for uh, identification and treatment of chronic wounds. Uh, basically, this free download shows that if you, you start with your most aggressive debridement to, to remove biofilm, combine that with effective antibiofilm therapy, such as hypochlorous acid, this will rapidly begin to reduce the planktonic and biofilm bio burden. Inflammation will decrease, proteases will decrease, the wound can start healing, and if needed, advanced therapies can be added because they will work very effectively when the wound bed is prepared well. Another really great review for you to look at is the effective pH on matrix proteins uh, by Steve Percival. And uh, this, again, just reinforces that a uh, more acidic pH is useful in terms of trying to promote healing in chronic uh, and acute wound beds. Hello, I'm Mark Moline. I'm a surgeon in Minneapolis as part of the M Health Fairview Wound Healing Institute at the South Campus. It's a distinct honor to be able to participate in this uh, educational series with Dr. Schultz and with Dr. Kim. My component is going to be focusing on hypochlorous acid Bosch as a component of the completeness of wound care. So as you've already heard, skin pH is normally acidic, ranging anywhere between four to six. And it's a critical aspect in terms of helping us to, to heal wounds, as we've now uh, demonstrated. There is a steep gradient of pH of approximately two to three units between the subcutaneous tissues and the underlying epidermis and dermis. And really, it, it takes a lot of energy to maintain that, but it's a very purposeful gradient in overall skin health. And this uh, phrase was first coined actually in 1928 in the, um, the journal cited here. So ultimately maintaining a skin pH of uh, in that 5.5 range as we talk about the acid mantle is critical to helping us to heal wounds. As has been talked about, when you're born, your skin pH is about seven, typical of the inside of the, um, the uterus and the amniotic cavity. And then as we age, starting age 75, 80, our skin pH tends to naturally go up again towards a neutral, hence why we see, tend to see more wounds in elderly patients. So understanding this then helps us understand how to recreate environments that will favor wound healing. One of the things we use a lot in our wound clinic is ceramides because there's also a significant ceramide deficiency observed as skin ages. So ceramide can be found in many different types of lotions. It's incredibly valuable for reconstituting a critical component of skin that is normally present in a, in a healthy milieu. Now, you may laugh at this, but actually, uh, I remember my grandma talking about using oranges, so citric acid, to be able to control odor in the axilla. And we know that if you look at the body, there are different areas that tend to have different smells. And typically, that's because they're colonized by certainly different types of bacteria. And of course, these would be the ones that tend to get moist and tend to be in dark areas. So we can see this in the axilla. We can see this in the groin. We can see this between the toes. And if we think about our patients that maybe have an elevated BMI, you'll see this in between the folds as well. 
you will also see these areas tend to have increased uh, fungal elements that live in this symbiotic relationship with these other types of bacteria, such as staphylococci and propionobacteria. Uh, Deodorants, of course, take advantage of these types of elements with citrates by reducing pH, and therefore it has an inhibitory impact on overall uh, bacterial activity. So if you look at this handprint, we do have a significant amount of flora, whether it's viruses, whether it's fungus, whether it's bacteria, that compose a healthy skin microbiome. Just like our gut microbiome, you need the commensal relationships to be able to have our skin thrive. So having bacteria within a wound is actually beneficial because we do derive certain elements that ultimately help in terms of that wound healing. A purely sterile wound environment actually may impede overall wound healing. As we've talked about, the groin and the axilla and the toes are oftentimes uh, moisture environments. They tend to have maybe an elevated pH skin environment, especially depending on what bacteria are living in uh, those areas. And as we see in our elderly population, especially they're bedridden, they may be subjected to even worse environments, especially in certain areas of their body, such as under a diaper where there may be feces, whether it's solid, whether it's liquid and incontinence with urine, all of these will have a significant negative impact upon skin, making it more likely for pressure ulcers such as sacral ulcers, issue tuberosity ulcers, and uh, coccygeal uh, ulcers to occur. So paying special attention to these areas in our elderly upstream can help decrease occurrence and all the significant comorbidities that come with this. So I'm gonna run through three cases uh, and then we're gonna get to a Q&A session. So first case is a 68-year-old female, adult with diabetes with hypertension, elevated BMI, and chronic lower extremity interstitial edema or lymphedema. Now, one of the things we always look for in our wound uh, clinic patients is those patients on amlodipine or Norvas, which we always stop because we know that in our patients, our wounded patients, this is a significant contributor to interstitial edema. Now, if you take 100 people on amlodipine, the vast majority do just fine. But if they're in your wound clinic, and they're on it and they've got a lower extremity ulceration, it is a significant contributor to lower extremity edema. It's one that we always recommend you stop. In our wound clinic also, we get ABIs on everybody. So this patient has a history of uh, peripheral arterial disease. You can see that back before they had wounds, they underwent a uh, exercise treadmill study. Typically we would not put our patients with a wound on a treadmill and there was a significant drop. There was a uh, past evidence of a right superficial artery and popliteal artery uh, stenosis that was moderate to severe. Vascular surgery had seen the patient that ex uh, recommended exercise rehabilitation mm -hmm. for management of the claudication. Again, this was all before development of an ulceration. Now in July 20 or July of 2021, the patient underwent a right total knee arthroplasty for degenerative joint disease and developed a right knee wound postoperatively as demonstrated here. So you can see the element of interstitial edema that's present. You can see the open wound. And of course, there's a relatively fresh total knee arthroplasty underneath that, which then has an elevated risk for developing an infection. We know from Steve Dean's paper that was published in Journal of Vascular Surgery that the ventral medial lymphatic bundle can oftentimes be become dysfunctional after total knee arthroplasties. So activating the thigh component of lymphatic management in, in addition to uh, local wound management will certainly help accelerate healing. So in this particular case, we repeated the ABIs to make sure that no significant uh, impact happened. And then we were really focused on a number of things, lowering wound pH with hypochlorous acid Bosch to decrease the wound biofilm. And it's important to point out that hypochlorite, which is the root bleach, has a higher pH. And that was really good in World War I, known as the corell dakin method. But in 2022, what we know about wound pH, as you've already heard from Dr. Kim and Dr. Schultz, that hypochlorous acid is the standard of care for accelerating wound healing. We use edemaware to impact dermal microdeformation and improve lymphatic function. And we also use extensive adjunctive micronutrients such as micronized purified flavonoid fraction, which is a component of hesperidin diosmin, which decreases bioinflammatory markers and significantly improves lymphatic function as well as venous tone. Our additional adjunctive micronutrients to improve endothelial and nitric oxide production include B12, B6 folate. We use high dose vitamin D, uh, vitamin C to improve collagen production. And if the patient's been on recent steroids or prednisone, we'll use a, a short 10 day course of vitamin A. And then we'll also use glutamine, um, hydroxymethylbutyrate, uh, and arginine, which is a component of a prepackaged um, nutritional 
um, uh, component. And then hydration. Don't forget about hydration because two liters of water a day will also make sure that people have adequate uh, end organ perfusion. So this is the case again where we started. And then this was where the patient was about 30 days later. And you can see significant progression in terms of wound closure. You can see those longitudinal lines along the lines of lymphatics. And again, the ABIs were relatively unchanged. We did get vascular surgery evolved again. They said, just continue to observe. And we had good wound healing at 30 days. Now to decrease recidivism rate, this is where we started using ceramides over the, over the incision and making sure that we got the patient with a certified lymphedema therapist and continue maximizing lymphatic function. So key points are chronic wounds have an alkaline pH. We want to lower that wound pH. Don't miss the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. Stop amlodipine norvasc, uh, as it's a very common cause of leg edema in the wounded patient. Elevated BMIs, of course, contribute to lymphatic dysfunction, as does deconditioning and sarcopenia, which most patients that are going to have a total knee arthroplasty uh, do have sarcopenia and deconditioning just because they've been able to exercise. And there are many cases of chronic leg edema that are in this form of lymphedema, prior deep venous thrombosis, trauma, knee surgery, um, and all these things contribute then to this development. Now in case two, insulin-dependent diabetic, dialysis, chronic leg edema with neuropathy in the 70-year-old male, and he sustained a, uh, an open distal fracture of the left leg with tibial exposure, which was subsequently repaired during the ER mission, and then he was sent to us because his wound started to break down. So obviously we're dealing with significant interstitial fluid shifts in a dialysis patient that's already prone to lower extremity edema. So this was at the consult, there was no hardware exposed, ABIs right away to make sure there was adequate uh, arterial perfusion demonstrated we had excellent arterial perfusion. So again, within the context of the, the totality of wound care, we started hypochlorous acid Bosch dressing changes twice a day. We got um, the patient into our adjunct of micronutrient and our uh, micronized purified flavonoid uh, regime of, as well as edemaware to increase and improve uh, interstitial edema and maximize lymphatic function. So here you can see the patient now at about four week follow-up. We have significant progression of granulation tissue at that undermining. Again, you can see where the edemaware is causing the significant dermal uh, micro deformation, which results in improved lymphatic function. And then you can see where the fibula was re uh, repaired on the lateral aspect, and again, significant improvement. And here we are at approximately 10 weeks postoperatively, and we have resolution. Again, within the totality of care, all of these elements participating in overall wound healing. So just a comparison, again, consult the closure at about 10 weeks. And obviously in this very complex patient, increased risk of lower extremity amputation, even with normal arterial flow. And the last case is a left total knee arthroplasty, adult onset diabetes, previous known coronary disease and has undergone a coronary stent chronic edema, which we again would recognize as chronic lymphedema, which is prevalent in almost every patient we see in our wound clinic, no history of BPNS thrombosis, and not on amlodipine Norvas. So here again, you can see, now this is a little disorienting. The top of the picture is the knee, the bottom would be the ankle, and then the leg was turned a little bit to the outside to be able to see where there was a satellite lesion that then undermined towards the midline wound. So we started the lymphedema component. We got going on hypochlorous acid irrigations of that wound and putting a, a packing in there and then started on the adjunct of micronutrients and the micronized purified flavonoid uh, com component. So here the patient is at four weeks, good granulation tissue, never had hardware exposure, ABIs were good. Here's at eight weeks follow-up, approximately late September. Again, nice progression, but this is not a healed wound. So we keep doing our lymphatic treatments, keep the adjunct of micronutrients, and then, again, comparing to the original consultation, the one thing I want to call out is see the significant interstitial edema in that original consult patient or uh, picture as compared to where we're at. And then here is that uh, final uh, healing. So again, nice reduction. We focused on interstitial edema reduction all the way to the mid-thigh across the ventral medial bundle along the knee, and then really focusing on making sure that we got that hypochlorous acid from that satellite wound, which you can now see as well healed and making sure that the totality that undermining biofilm was complete. Because if you have undermining a situation like this, you will absolutely have biofilm. And your option is to totally resect that area, which just increases your risk for an issue versus really filling that whole cavity with hypochlorous acid and letting it do its work as Dr. Schultz and Dr. Kim have talked about. Thank you uh, from Dr. Kim, Dr. Schultz, and myself for participating in this uh, wound con uh, educational opportunity. And at this point, we're gonna get ready to take questions. Thank you.
All right. That was uh, some great discussion that we had and great lectures from Dr. Schultz and Dr. Mellon. This is Paul Kim. This is the Q&A session. I'm really excited because we had a ton of questions <laughs> that come through today, and I've got some questions but for, uh, that I'd like to get answered as well. And just to get started, I want to start with some basic questions about hypochlorous acid because there does seem to be quite a few uh, questions about that. Um, and so this is to you, Greg. I, you know, there, I was looking at your, your curve of efficacy against bacteria and biofilm, and the contact time is a really important aspect of that, that slide that you, you showed. Uh, I guess the question is, it looks like it needs some minimal contact time. What is the how long should we be soaking? And one of the questions really addressed this directly, is it, should we be irrigating with this? Is that enough? Or should we be soaking a gauze dressing and placing it on for a certain period of time? What's your thoughts on that, Greg? Well, that, that's a very good question. And in, in the laboratory, um, we can plot a time course of kill for planktonic bacteria and also for biofilm bacteria, as I showed in one of the slides. And there's two things. Um, it depends on the concentration of the hypochlorous acid. So in the hypochlorous acid at pH 5.5, um, the concentration is about 300 parts per million, which is a, a, a very adequate concentration to rapidly kill the planktonics. That happens literally within 15 to 30 seconds of contact time, very rapid, because the hypochlorous acid is a very oxidating molecule. Now, when it's in a biofilm, um, the time that is needed to reduce the biofilm CFUs down to near zero um, is a little bit, and this sounds like I'm dodging the question, but it's a little bit dependent on both the bacteria, that is what type of biofilm they formed, and also where the biofilm is located. So in most uh, animal studies, and show that about a five minute exposure is usually adequate to kill all the planktonics and a very significant reduction in the biofilm. That meaning somewhere around three to four logs out of say a five or six log concentration in, in animal models. Um, there aren't really good careful studies done like that in humans because it's kind of hard to um, perform those studies under uh, ethical reviews by committees. So we're, we're really restricted to what the laboratory and the animal models tell us. But to try to simplify it, killing the planktonic bacteria is very rapid. The only thing that delays that is if the bugs are under the surface of the wound bed and the hypochlorous acid has to penetrate deeper into the tissue, that'll take a little more time. And the hypochlorous acid can get partially neutralized as it uh, even reacts with things like collagen. In biofilms, usually the best estimate is a, about a five minute contact on an exposure. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't get a benefit if you do it for two minutes. And if you can leave it for seven, eight, ten minutes, then by that time, most all of the available hypochlorous acid molecules have chemically reacted. So there isn't this um, increased killing with infinitely longer time of exposures. It, it definitely has an optimal period, and usually that's about five minutes, maybe up to six or seven minutes in most human wounds with typical chronic wounds. Thank you, Greg. And just along that line, this is to, to you, um, Dr. Mellon, but um, just as a thought, I was thinking, would it be nice to have like a gel or cream formulation that would maybe a sustained release formulation uh, in between dressing changes? But and going back to what we've been discussing here is more of a practical matter of about application. Uh, Dr. Mellon, do you, this is what I do, and, and I want to ask you if this is, this is kind of the way that you do it, is I'll have the, the MOA start soaking the wound prior to me entering the clinic room, uh, 
then I'll excisionally debride, sharp debride, and then I'll reapply a wet to dry, again, using uh, hypochlorous acid the entire time. Is that how you approach this, th these wounds in the clinic? Well, it's exactly the way we do it. So our MOAs will go in. We usually uh, have a topical lidocaine on for a bit to achieve a little bit of uh, anesthetic effect to allow adequate debridement, and then we'll use um, hypochlorous acid, so gauze for a uh, non-selective debridement, and then we'll soak it back on there. And uh, when we're doing, so we'll have a poster down at SAWC actually that's going to address doing moist twice a day hypochlorous acid dressing changes. And to your point about, and this will be a series of 25, so uh, look for that poster too. To your point about the gel, there is there are gels out there that have a pH of 6.0 as a hydrogel. Um, it'd be nice to have it just a touch lower. And so we've used, utilized some of those gels as well. You just have to look at specifically at the manufacturer uh, descriptions about whether that hydrogel is more towards the alkaline side or the, um, the uh, down towards the acidic side. Are there any other um, antiseptics that, you know, I, I, I tend to use, either, I use hypochlorous acid in the clinic, but from the outpatient side where perhaps my patients are indigent or they don't have any insurance or they don't have, uh, they really don't have any disposable income, sometimes I recommend something like acetic acid, a dilute acetic acid. There's some questions in the, the chat box talking about other solutions because there's seem, seemingly so many solutions, and I know that pH is the focus of this session, but there are so many other aspects of wounds that we're, we're thinking about. Are there any other solutions that, that uh, you use, Dr. Mellon, in your practice beyond hypochlorous acid or is it hypochlorous acid all the time? Uh, no, in, there are, depending on economics, uh, we'll do white vinegar with clean water to achieve that um, acetic acid component for dressing changes. So I agree with you, Paul. We we use the same thing. And then every now and then I'll use very briefly something that's got a surfactant, but I think that's so critical. Most of the surfactant components have a higher pH, and we have that in contact for a short period of time, and then we'll we'll do our best to dive that pH again to get down into that 5.5 uh, .5 to 6 range because we know that's where the clinical benefit is for the long term. Dr. Schultz, I know that there's there's a ton of questions about other antiseptics, including uh, clomidine solution. Uh, there's some mention of chlorhexidine and Dakins. I know you've shown some slides, and I've I've actually sat into a couple of your lectures where you've discussed sort of the benefits and um, some of the detrimental effects of some of these anti other antiseptics. So overall, I know you you sort of covered this in your lecture. If you take it all and you had to summarize, uh, comparing or versus these others in an in vitro or vivo model. Uh, what is your kind of your summary statement when you go to recommend one versus the other? Well, that that's a, an important clinical uh, question. I, I agree. And in general, when different antiseptic solutions are compared on cell cultures or on uh, laboratory models for planktonic and biofilms. It turns out that, again, this, this concept of this therapeutic index really becomes, I think, useful to think about. So just remind you, the therapeutic index is the ratio of the concentration that is not going, that the highest concentration that's not going to cause cell death divided by the concentration that is needed to kill planktonic bacteria. They don't have a therapeutic index standard test for biofilm yet, but using planktonic bacteria as the example, it turns out that the hypochlorous acid at about pH 5.5 generally tends to have the best therapeutic index across a wide range of planktonic bacteria and uh, yeast. In part, that's due to the fact that the hypochlorous acid is a very chemically reactive molecule. So it doesn't take much of the hypochlorous acid concentration-wise to kill planktonic bacteria. It is probably one of the most effective, in other words, has the lowest minimum bactericidal concentration. So very, very good at killing bugs. <clears throat> 
In addition, um, in a cytotoxicity assay, it turns out that our cells actually make a number of reducing molecules to protect us from excessive amounts of reactive oxygen molecules. Remember hypochlorous acid, hydrogen peroxide are the two microbicidal chemicals that our body normally makes. Well, we have evolved the ability to protect our cells against these reactive molecules through production of reducing molecules. Those are things like, like glutathione. So it turns out that the natural microbicides, that is the hypochlorous acid in pH 5, um, is the way our cells normally engulf and kill bugs, and we have evolved protections to keep the hypochlorous acid from killing our cells through the generation of the uh, reducing. So bottom line, each of the different microbicidal solutions can have a so Dr. Schultz, you, you kind of, yeah, Dr. Schultz, you've been kind of cutting in and out for, but I think the the general message came clear, came through clearly that across, you know, there's there's different reasons why we use different things, but across this range of the needs of the wound, it seems like hypochlorous acid is a good option. Um, Dr. Mellon, I had, I had a question for you, and this is questions that have been coming in. And this is actually an interesting one from uh, Patricia Stewart, who asked the question, can hypochlorous acid be used for debridement? I think what she's asking is beyond that of just mechanical, wet to dry, kind of peeling away of the surface of the wound, does it in itself, have you observed any debridement um, components to, to that solution? Well, we certainly see when we use it repetitively over the course of time, if you're using it as a moist dressing application, and in our experience of changing it twice a day, which obviously is laborious but for, for some patients and for their family, but we do see significant alteration in the biofilm, which leads ultimately to a uh, debridement quality that results in angiogenesis. So we do, we do see it in this way, supporting uh, debridement over time, absolutely. So, you know, it's, it's and I really, oh, I just go ahead. we avoid kind of talking that concept wet to dry. I kind of joke with the residents that wet to dry is a great way to make beef jerky, but in really in wound care, we're always trying to maintain a moist wound environment. Yeah, and that, that's a good point um, because I, I, I often, you guys hear this from your patients as well, where they say, oh, we like to leave it to air dry so they don't put anything on there. And I'm like, well, that's not necessarily a good idea. Can you be? <laughs> Contaminated by right. something in your yeah. house. Um, you know, there's there's a, there's a ton of questions about concentration. Uh, how about the, does the the dilution have anything to do with changing of the pH or pushing that pH down uh, down the scale a little bit? Uh, Dr. Schultz, do you have any answers for us? Yeah, that that's an important chemistry question, and um, you know the, the reality is that the different antiseptic solutions <laughs> tend to always have a buffer with, and they get the pH if they get diluted with water. The pH really doesn't change that much because you're not adding acid or base; you're just adding water to it, and the buffer uh, uh, that is uh, made in the commercial formulation tends to dominate the pH. So if the solution gets diluted like quarter strength bacon, there was a question about quarter strength bacon, you know, it, it has a borate buffer that keeps it up around nine and a half or so. If you dilute it down, the pH of the solution doesn't change, the, but the concentration of the buffer gets reduced. However, that buffer still can raise the pH of a wound solution because it's fighting the buffer that's in our blood, our bicarbonate buffering system. So in, in reality, it may have a less effect if, it, if a solution with a buffer gets diluted, but it, it's still going to have a tendency to 
increase the pH, raise the pH into the basic range, like say, like with the Bacon solution, which really we want to go the opposite way. We want to be in a more acidic environment, um, especially during the uh, early phases of the uh, conversion from a inflamed biofilm dominant wound up into a, a healing phase. Thank you. Uh, I think I, I, you know, I have a general thought, or I guess a comment or a question for for you two, um, and perhaps the audience as well. You know, the frequency of dressing change. This has come up on on the Q and A tab as well. You know, it's easy for providers to write orders for BID, TID, QID dressing change. The actual execution, I think, is the difficult part for patients. When we're talking about things like hypochlorous acid. Um, can can those be done less frequently? Is there any evidence to show that more frequent applications of hypo, something like hypochlorous acid is a benefit to patients? So can we start with Dr. Mellon? I, I think this is really deserving of uh, data and a good quality RCT to determine effic efficacy for this. So could, say, covering with a um, occlusive dressing result in maintenance of uh, that inadequate low pH wound environment and changing it once a day. I, we haven't gotten to that point. I know that uh, we certainly use hypochlorous acid in all of our installation vacs in the, um, in the hospital, which has a significant benefit in accelerating wound care. But for the outpatient, I agree the burden is twice a day, but I really think it, it's going to need more, uh, more data and more study to really come up with an effective um, treatment regime. Is there any um, evidence in the, the basic science literature, Dr. Schultz, regarding um, the frequency of doing these dressing changes and, and, and improving our outcomes? The, the animal studies in general tend to try to follow what is a reasonable clinical protocol. So they're typically done um, at most, say, two three times in a 24-hour period. Uh, and so, as Mark said, we don't have data from clinics or really even from animals where the dressing is saturated with the hypochlorous acid then placed on the wound and so on. But I, I think the the data that Mark was describing from the negative pressure with installation there are several good papers that show that if there are, say, six to ten cycles in a 24-hour period with a about a 10-minute dwell, that the bio burden and the slough and the debris tend to rapidly get reduced. So the, I, I interpret those data from the, the clinical study showing that more frequent in these chronic wounds that are getting the negative pressure with insulation it still has a tremendous benefit to the patient. In other words, it's not killing the wound cells so that the wound turns, you know, dark and necrotic. Actually, it's helping to reduce the bio burden. The hypochlorous can begin to break down some of the denatured matrix through chemical oxidation of collagen that goes off on biochemistry. But, but the bottom line is the clinical, I am impressed by the clinical results from the negative pressure with installation doing about six to 10 cycles with a 10 minute dwell. And I think that is reassuring that that frequency is not going to have a detrimental effect on the In fact, it's beneficial. Thank you. Uh, we're running out of time here. I just want to thank Dr. Mark Mellon and Dr. Greg Schultz and all of you for attending this very informative session. I did learn quite a bit myself. Uh, I appreciate you guys all attending.